Hello ladies, welcome. So today I'm going to be reading from the book The Seduction Mystique by Jeannie Sales. If you are not familiar with Jeannie Sales, she has several dating and relationship books. Her uh, niche is focusing on how to teach women to meet and marry men of wealth. She's been around for quite a while now and she has a lot of good books and a lot of good advice in her books. I thought this would be a good book to read because we are moving into the spring and summer and after a lot of us have been um, not mixing and mingling maybe the way that we were or some of us just never got to do that and then the whole situation happened with you know I don't even want to say the name of the thing that has happened to us all <laughs> in 2020 but um, I just thought this would be a really good book to come and read some of and it would be helpful to a lot of you ladies out there who are starting to date again or you're thinking about dating or maybe you just need to add some passion to your current relationship and this probably would make you think um, or give you some new thoughts about some things. So I'm going to read first a bit of the table of contents and I, she doesn't have them in chapters, she has them in parts. So part one is how to be a man magnet. Part two, how to develop a relationship. I'm scrolling here. Part three, how to get married. Okay, so it looks like it's just those three, but it looks like it's like 28 sections in the book. One of the things that I think when I, when I remember reading this book that is really helpful um, is six where she says package yourself for relationships. So I'm gonna touch on a bit of that. One of the other things that's very interesting in this book is that she does touch on former lovers and ex-wives. That's also something very helpful that I definitely recommend that you read. I may be able to touch on that a bit. I don't want this video to be too long. As you know, if you've listened to me before, you know I don't like these videos to be too long. Um, so I'm going to read the part. I'm going to read the part in part one, section two, where she has men are wonderful, not perfect. You can never relate intimately with a man until you share his humanity and he shares yours. Jeannie Sales. You may have disappointments and unresolved anger from past relationships with men. You may have fears about them. That's okay. We have all felt that way at some point in our lives. So, if you have nothing to draw from to spark a feeling of how wonderful men are, then begin with one simple view of men, compassion. Look at a group of men talking to each other the next time you are out, then look at each one separately. The first one you are looking at may be talking confidently, laughing. He may truly be enjoying himself, yet at the same time, he is reaching for friendship in this interaction. He needs to feel connected to those around him just as you do. The man you are looking at wants what you want in a relationship too. He wants a fulfilling one-on-one -on -one relationship. He wants to love and to be loved by a woman. He wants to take her in his arms and call her darling and say all the other endearments you and all women want to hear. He wants this. He wants what you want, although he may be talking about business or sports with the men around him at this moment. On a much deeper level, he and all the men there are fraught with insecurities you do not see. The man you are looking at is sometimes unsure about his looks. He worries about getting old, about looking old. He worries about losing his hair. He worries about his weight, his fitness, his health, and how his body compares with men, other men his age. He worries about sex. Is he average, below average? He worries about how he compares in bed with the man standing next to him. He worries about success, making money, pleasing women, finding love, or a lasting love. And yes, he worries about his job, debts, investments, death, and taxes. Sound familiar? Yes, he is just like you exactly like you. Men may have been socialized to express or not to express these feelings in ways that are different from you, but the man you are looking at, the very precious man you see, carries the same insecurities, fears, frustrations, 
needs, and desires that you do. Bless his little heart. To retrain your view of men as wonderful, channel it through compassion. Elizabeth had a distrustful view of, I have never in my life looked at any man and said, bless his little heart, she said, amazed at the idea. But that is because she had never realized that a man can be seriously flawed and still wonderful. After our consultations, she deliberately began looking at men, thinking of their insecurities and saying to herself, bless his little heart. She found a new compassion for men and she learned that compassion dissolves the artificial barriers between men and women. You can never relate intimately with a man until you share his humanity and until he shares yours. Sharing humanity begins with the force of compassion. Men are wonderful. So the next section is you are wonderful and then she has one that says sex is wonderful. So in this book, she does talk about a mantra that women should repeat and it's men are wonderful, I am wonderful, sex is wonderful. <laughs> so I don't know if you are into uh, affirmations, but that's something that you could um, maybe write down or think to yourself to get rid of negative thought that you, thoughts that you may be having around dating. Uh, so in the section where she has, you are wonderful, she has a quote here that, that says, remember, you are the ultimate authority on you. And then I'll read a little bit of this. I am wonderful. Say it out loud right now. That is the second set of magic words. You are wonderful and you are. Your very existence is a magical moment in time and you already have everything it takes to be loved and cherished by men. You are just learning how to use it. Why don't you always see yourself as wonderful? Because you see yourself through the mental filter belief system of all the mistakes you have made, all the regrets you have, all the times you felt you've made a fool of yourself. You see yourself through the distorted lens of your imagined shortcomings. And I'm going to stop there and I'm going to just go to the next section because in this section you are wonderful. She's just telling you how to think better of yourself. And she has a section here that says how to be your own best friend, which is definitely something very important. Um, because I believe that if we want others to love us, we have to love ourselves first. And that happens by getting to know yourself. Definitely. So then the next or the yeah, the next one is sex is wonderful. And her quote here is your sexuality is as individual as a snowflake, as unique as your thumbprint. Therefore, you can never be in for inferior to anyone. So I'll read some of this. When I was 10 years old, kids at school began saying snappy sounding four letter words in whispers and giggles when adults were not around. Naturally, I wouldn't dare let them know I didn't understand the words they were using, but I couldn't ignore the situation either. As I helped a mother set the dinner table one evening, I innocently asked her what one of the words meant. Her reaction scared the daylights out of me. She was very upset and she did not tell me what the word meant, but I knew not to ask again. What a bind. I couldn't be uncool and ask the kids, risking ridicule, and I couldn't ask mother again. Determined to find out, I visited our public library with the list of words I'd written on a scrap of paper wadded in my fist. An hour later, I had scratched out almost every word on my list because the words were not in the Webster's Dictionary. All but one word, sex. Obviously, Mr. Webster did not want his kids to know the meaning of sex either. Next, I went through the library card catalog, slowly locating every book on sex the library had. Not one of them was checked out. It's no wonder. The small town library only had a few tedious and technical old medical books on the subject at that time. I was the shortest girl in my class and small for my age. My feet only touched the floor if I sat on the very edge of the tall, hard, 
and old-fashioned wooden library chairs at the big tables. It was uncomfortable, but after my mother's reaction, I was afraid to check out the books to take home. So I sat uncomfortably at the table for a long time and studied the diagrams in each book, memorizing the terms until I knew what sex was. That is how I learned about it. That was the technical part of sex. The experiential part of sex came years later. What the pictures, diagrams, and medical books did not tell me is this. Your sexual uniqueness is wonderful. Did you know that each snowflake is an original design? There is never another snowflake like it. Snowflakes may look alike because of the elements they have in common. They may even behave alike, but each snowflake is a design of nature that will never again be duplicated. Consequently, there is no such thing as a superior or inferior snowflake. Each is unique and comparable. Likewise, no two thumbprints are ever the same. People have traits in common and may seem alike, but each individual is a design of nature that will never again be duplicated. Each is unique, incomparable, and your precious sexuality is exactly the same way. No two women express sex exactly alike. They may have elements of sexuality in common that may seem alike on the surface, but each woman's sensuality is a design of nature that will never again be duplicated. Consequently, there is no such thing as a superior or inferior sexuality. Each is unique and comparable. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. It's just giving you an idea of what she has in here. And then she has a section that says become comfortable with your sexuality. Uh, because that's something really important is to actually be comfortable with your sexuality if you're going to be in a relationship with anyone, you definitely have to be comfortable with your sexuality and comfortable with sex. Uh, she has a section in here called How to Have Wonderful Sex. Uh, the headings are Respect Sex, Have a Sex Fun, uh, Perspective About Sex. Uh, she just has like uh, some really good information in here. So let me see here. I think I'm going to read, let me see if I can find the... Okay, she has this this um, section. It's uh, it's still part of um, part one, and it's a six. Package yourself for relationships. So so the quote here is, "Do not believe what a man says he wants in a woman. Watch what he responds to." I think that is very true because men oftentimes don't even realize what they. Um, necessarily want. They think they know, just like sometimes that's true for women too, though. So I'm going to read a bit of this. If you ask a man what he wants in a woman, he will describe traits that sound like a Girl Scout. If you ask a man how he wants a woman to look, he will say he wants her to look natural. But turn him loose and he will end up with a woman who is nothing like a Girl Scout and who wears makeup like Tammy Faye Baker. Please understand, he was not lying before. He simply said what he thought he was supposed to want. So you have to find out by yourself what he wants. How? Do not listen to what a man says he wants in a woman. Watch what a man responds to in women. Overall, no matter what they say, let's look at what most men respond to. And I'm not going to read the entire paragraphs under these, but I'll read the headers. Men respond to cleanliness. Men do respond to makeup. She has a section in here on cosmetic surgery, permanent makeup, etc. And then she has men respond to hairstyles. <clears throat> um, then she has, yeah, she talks about length, color. Men respond to jewelry. Men respond to nail care. Men respond to perfume. And men respond to colors. Yeah, let's see here. And then she talks about the different colors and how those colors um, affect just people in general. So that's a really interesting thing to read about. 
men respond to sophisticated styles and then she has a basic man appealing wardrobe so i'll read this to you because i think this is interesting and remember this book was written some time ago so but i think that you could still get get a good idea of what what she's talking about here so a good basic man appealing wardrobe can look like this one bright red blazer one black blazer one bright red blouse two bright white shirt or blouse a hot pink blouse or turtleneck a pale pink turtleneck a pale blue blouse a black turtleneck she says if you have a long neck you should wear rounded collars or turtlenecks if you have a short neck wear v-neck shirts dresses and sweaters or open the top two to three buttons on your shirt and then she has skirts pants suits dresses accessories um then she has a section here that talks about combining your wardrobe and creating looks and let's see then the next section after this is how to have confidence and i'm going to read this section here because i thought this was interesting add men and romance to your daily life i think this is really important if you're trying to meet someone um because i do believe that what we focus on a lot we can bring that into our lives that's why i'm like very careful about negative thinking or at least i try to be i mean i'm human so sometimes i do have negative thoughts but most of the time i'm pretty optimistic and i try to keep my thoughts pretty positive so in section nine she has add men and romance to your daily life and her quote here is have fun meeting men and of course always always keep your personal safety as your number one priority at all times one of the most common questions women ask me is where can i go to meet men every single time without exception i have glanced around us and we were outnumbered by men sharp men what about these men i ask the women all are always surprised when i ask that looking around they seem to feel that it is impossible to meet the man standing at the elevator the man reading the paper the man rummaging through his briefcase that is balanced rec precautiously on his knee or the man sipping coffee at the next table there is a myth in our society that there is a place where all the meetable, dateable, single, and available men are. And if you can just learn the name of this place, you'll go get yours. You are single and available right now. You are single and available when you fill up your car with gas. You are single and available when you dash into the convenience store to buy milk. You are single and available when you pick up your clothes from the cleaners. You are single and available when you browse a card shop for a friend's birthday. You are single and available as you push your shopping cart down the supermarket aisle. I'm gonna stop here to say this is so true. I can't tell you how many times men have talked to me like when I've been in the grocery store or in Trader Joe's, which is my favorite place. So yeah, men will talk to you ladies, but I think that what happens is sometimes you probably don't realize that they're actually flirting with you, but most of the time if they're talking to you, they're flirting with you. Okay, so um, I'll skip down a little bit. All these normal everyday places you go in your day to day life are exactly the places to meet men everywhere. There is no shortage of men to meet. If there is one thing men have in common with God, it is that they are everywhere, everywhere. I 100% agree with her about that ladies. It's just a matter of changing your mindset. So then she has bolded here. You meet men wherever there are warm bodies. Very true. Okay. So let me see, I wanna scroll down to, she has how to develop a relationship, um, create chemistry. Um, I don't know, I don't know, let me see what she's saying here because I don't know if I believe chemistry is something that can be created. So the quote for how to create dating chemistry is do not put your life on hold waiting for Mr. Right. That's her quote for that one. So then she has, let's pretend that one winter long ago you caught the flu and had to stay home from work. In fact, from going anywhere for three weeks. You said to yourself on that first night, well, it is awfully early, but as long as I am stuck at home, I may as well take a hot bubble bath. Then slip into my snuggly robe and fuzzy slippers, pop something easy into the microwave, settle in front of the TV with my remote, and then go to bed early. That sounds good, doesn't it? It should sound good because after all, you're sick. <laughs> I love my bed, so 
but I, I, to, I totally get what she's saying. I love my bed when it's cold outside. I should make that clear. Um, when it's nice weather, I'm always out and about someplace. Okay, so the three weeks go by and in the same mode, early bath, robe, slippers, microwave, TV, early bed until so you're finally back to excellent health. After your first day back at work, you arrive home, your telephone rings, and when you, you answer, a friend says, hello there. It's good to have you back in the world. Let's go out tonight. In the background, you hear your bath water drawing up, <laughs> and on the way home from work, you stopped and picked up something for the microwave, and you definitely know what is on television tonight. At that point, you say, uh, can we take a rain track check on it? All too soon, another three weeks has slipped by in this now cozy routine, then another and another until it has been six months. Still another six months go by making it a year, and then it's two years. Your life has become a routine of comfort and ease and loneliness. So I'm going to stop there just to say that's interesting that she put that in there because it's really true. It's easy for us to get into a routine of just like not going out and not meeting people. But if you want to meet a partner, you really do have to be willing to put yourself out there and um, just go out, just go to dinner. I mean, just go out. I think, you know, I know it's been challenging because of what we've been dealing with the last year, but a lot of things are starting to open up again. And a lot of people are like really trying to get out. Um, so I think that there will, there will be a lot more opportunities to meet people that maybe you wouldn't even have been able to meet before. Okay, so here, here's dating, what she says about dating chemistry. Dating chemistry is something you create. Whatever your date life is right, what, excuse me, whatever your date life is right now is a measurement of the dating chemistry you have created for yourself. If you do not like your current level of dating chemistry, you can recreate it. Dating chemistry is created like this. Being alone, breed being alone. Being with the same sex friends all the time breeds being with the same sex friends all the time. And being with dates breeds being with dates. We are human beings and creatures of habit. Whatever we do a few times gradually becomes more comfortable for us to do the next time. Until after a while, we are very, very comfortable with that behavior. It becomes natural for us. We have then developed an affinity or chemistry with people and circumstances that are similar to that activity or behavior. The more men you date, the sooner you can marry. And she has that part bolded. I, I do agree with that. And um, definitely 100 because it's just about putting yourself out there. So I 100% agree with her about that. And you're getting to see. Um, I don't know, maybe when you were in your, your 20s and 30s and now you're in your 50s, so just say that you have a different um, type or a different idea about the type of man you want to attract. So when you're, or I, I won't say 50s, so maybe a lot of women in their 50s are married. But if you were in in your 20s and you attracted or and were interested in attracting the same, a certain type of man, maybe you don't look for that anymore in your 30s. If you are a woman who is divorced, you may not require the same things of a man that you required before you were ever married. So what she's saying um, there is very true. It's definitely about putting yourself out there and making sure that you are actually going on dates with men. Because if you're only hanging out with your girlfriends, then like she's saying here, you're just going to continue to only hang out with your girlfriends. So then she has a formula here. She said she says the formula for developing dating chemistry is begin with entry level dating. Begin to reaccustom yourself to be with men as often as possible by dating as many men as possible. Create pockets of time with men daily. Learn to enjoy men on many different levels. Um, play your percentages. And what she's saying here when she talks about begin to reaccustom yourself to be with men as often as possible by dating as many men as possible, that's very true. And one way you can achieve that is by online dating. If you're a woman who's not comfortable being around men, maybe you were in the past or maybe you never have been or whatever the situation is, that's one way to get comfortable with sitting and talking with men is if you meet guys online, you don't have to go to dinner with them. Um, if that's your requirement and that's your thing, I understand that. But just being around men will help you to be comfortable being around men and help you to deal with, um, I don't know, negative feelings that you may have around dating. So let's see here. I'm going to um, 
Yeah, she has it's just so much good information in here. Okay, so she has a she has former lovers and ex wives. I'm gonna see what she's talking about here because I really believe that um she, I mean she just has so much good information in this book and I like I said it's been a while since I've read this. I don't know if it's this book or her other book where she talks about this, but it may be this book. So let me see here. Um so this is seventeen, former lovers, ex wives. And then her quote here is X means no more fights. X means no more anything in a man's life. 100% I agree with that. Former lovers, ex-wives, and children are part of relationship terrain today. So you need to know the lay of the land and have a good clear roadmap for navigating your way around it. Otherwise, you can get so lost in a maze of previous relationship subtleties that you feel like Dr. Livingston who disappeared many years ago in the wilds of Africa. Former lovers. A former lover may or may not have children by your man. If she does, read about ex-wives because she fits more in that category than this one. If an ex-wife did not have children by him, she belongs in this category for former lovers after the marriage ended because there is no reason for contact with him at all. A former lover who sends text messages, hangs around, calls, shows up, and makes a general pest of herself is obsessed with your man. She is not emotionally finished with him, and she hangs on to the idea that she can rekindle his interest in her. You have to figure out if he is enjoying the game, even though he complains about her, or if he really wants to be rid of her. If she is just a pest and he wants to be rid of her, after a recent breakup, he will not answer her text or calls. I'm going to stop there because that's pretty much the gist of this. Um, and then she talks about what, what the man will do if this woman is venge vengeful. Then the next section is pleasant ex-wives. Um, I'll read some of that. If an ex-wife has married again or has pulled her life together, she will not contact your man except to say what time she will be by to pick up the kids. Consider yourself in dreamland. This is a woman you can be pleasant with. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Um, problem ex-wives. A troublesome ex-wife may pull out all the stops, guilt, blame, and shame, and she knows all his hot buttons to do it too. His duty, his obligation, his responsibility. She will accuse him in order to gain leverage, blame, accusation, and more criticism. And furthermore, according to her, it is all your fault. He is putting you before his very own flesh and blood, the innocent children who were in his life before you were. Shame, shame, and more shame. Do not put up with problem ex-wives. Any ex-wife who still calls for advice or who comes over is infringing and has no rights to fairness or to anything else. That is why she is an ex. X means no more rights. X means no more anything to this man's life. This is all the more true if there are no children or if the children are grown. An ex-wife with children by your man may seem to think, and so may he, that they have an obligation to talk to each other and to be a part of each other's lives because of the children they share. That depends on the frequency and on the type of interaction she has with him. Have they slept together occasionally since they divorced? Do they spend Christmas together with the children? Do they have lengthy talks on the telephone several times a week? Do they meet for coffee or dinner when he brings the children back from visitation or vice versa? If so, they are still married psychologically and only technically divorced. I 100% agree with this, ladies. If you are dealing with a man who has an ex that he is very involved with like this, it is highly inappropriate. He has not put up any boundaries um, to move on and have another relationship. If he's dating casually, that's fine. But if he's saying that he's dating, looking for a committed relationship, but he's not put up the proper boundaries with his ex, he has not made space in his life for you or any other woman. So you probably should just cut your losses with this. It's it's very dysfunctional, um, and it it sounds like it would just be a lot of drama and just really not even waste your time. And the one question to ask yourself is this: If you find yourself in a situation with a man like this, where his ex is always coming around, 
calling him. They still talk and fight and they have all of this drama like they're still a couple. Ask yourself if he would be okay if the shoe was on the other foot. If he was pursuing you for something serious and your ex-husband or your ex-girlfriend because you have a child with him is always coming over to your place, is calling you, talking about things that they should be talking about to a friend, you know, you get the picture. And if the and more than likely the answer will be absolutely no, hell no, a hot no, because men just can't deal with stuff like that at all. So then, yeah, you should probably just cut um, cut your losses with a guy like this and find a man who's actually truly, really single and ready for a committed relationship. Um, so I'm going to scroll, scroll down a little bit here. Um, she gives you really, really good information about how to deal with women like this, too, because they know that they're wrong. But a lot of times because they haven't... Uh, gotten a new relationship they don't really want their ex to have a relationship either so what they do is they use the child or the children to prevent that from happening out of bitterness sometimes or just unhappiness or whatever is going on in their mind but it has to be up to the man to put his foot down and not to allow that to stop him from having a life because we all know what happens with children as much as we love our children they grow up one day they have their own lives and if anyone is silly enough to sacrifice their lives for their children they find that out an old age that that was just not a good idea at all so okay let me scroll some more she's talking about this for quite a while <laughs> and I, I understand why so then she talks about children um types of relationship fights she talks about if he cheats living together how to get married okay so I'm going to read this because I think this was really interesting she put 10 reasons women do not marry and I'm good this will, this will be the last one that I read um because I think this is getting to be a bit long but okay so 10 reasons women do not marry Mr. Reddy is Mr. Right that's her quote here so one they cannot find the right man when you cannot find the right man it is because there is a part of yourself you have not accepted when you cannot accept your own imperfections you cannot accept imperfections in men one of the exercises I have for clients who feel they cannot find the right man is that I have them marry themselves. I'm going to stop there. And then the next one is they want men who do not want them. A woman who is really ready for marriage has no ego attachment to unavailable men. By that, I mean that she is not challenged by men who are emotionally unable to commit. She does not yearn for a man who has circumstances that make him unavailable, such as being married or living with someone, or as he, he is too busy to be with her, or has to make her the last priority on his to-do list, or a man who needs more time. More time for what? Three, they are stuck in a dead past. Sadness, anger, and fear are all telltale symptoms of not living in the now of being stuck in the unchangeable past. There is fear of getting into another relationship that could hurt if it did not work out. The healthy use of fear is that it teaches you good sense in relationships. The unhealthy use of fear is to stop having relationships. Four, they are stuck in an imagined future. The woman who is stuck in an imagined future is easy to identify because she knows exactly what she wants in a man and exactly what she does not want in a man. She can tell you what he will be like and what their life will be like. She has a criteria list half a page long or longer. And then we'll scroll down again. Five, they want to get married, but not to waste time dating. A woman sat down for a consultation with me, let out a deep breath and said, I want to get married. I am even willing to pay to meet somebody I just don't want to go through the process of looking for a husband again. I don't want to go to the trouble of having to get ready and go out. I dread the whole business of dating. When you are ready for marriage, you will not dread the process of finding a mate. You will feel excited and energized by the process. You will have fun meeting lots of new men and all the new experiences you can have with the different ones of them. Okay, I'm gonna to scroll to the next one. Six, they do not accept responsibility for having relationships. You are just as responsible for providing love and relationships for you as you are for providing physical shelter for yourself. Begin to change your relationship life by saying out loud, 
I accept responsibility for all my relationships, past, present, and future. You will feel a new power into your relationship life. Say it over and over and often. Okay, I'm going to scroll to the next one. They are too, they are too unselfish. You must want marriage for yourself. Otherwise, a man may lead you on for years until he decides to leave. And you must know how to stick up for yourself in relationships, to insist on being treated fairly, and to refuse to be treated poorly. That is what, that is what marriage material is in a woman. Eight, they are highly involved with family. Anytime a woman feels greater allegiance to her family than she does to her relationship with a man, she does not deserve to get married. If she were married, he would suffer unfairly in their marriage. A woman needs to make her choice of not involving her family in her love life and never confide in troubles he may be having with them. Nine, they are waiting for something or for someone to change. In the past, you may have thought you would be ready for someone to marry you if or when certain things happened in your life. Some of the excuses people use not to marry are, mother still needs me to look after her, or Sam loves me, but he needs more time. Again, more time for what? 10. They will not date men who are not their type. I once heard on television that the biggest social disease in our country is loneliness. So I asked myself, what causes loneliness? Studying my clients, I realized that loneliness is caused by labels. You will only relate to a person up to the point of a label you put on that person. How limited such labels are. In our slap a label on it world, we size people up according to some handy label that may bear no resemblance whatsoever to the true quality of the person. Okay, so that is, I'm going to stop reading there. That was some of the section 10 reasons women do not marry. The next section she has is becoming marriageable. Um, then it's, do you have a marriage prone relationship? Bringing up marriage like a winner and how you can be the heroine of this book. So I definitely recommend ladies that you read this book. Um, it's a, it has a lot of information that, that would really be helpful to you in your dating life. And in your relationships, maybe you're already in a relationship, but you're thinking about some things, especially the parts on um, just, you know, understanding men and if, if there are children involved and things like that. She has a, a section in there about that also. So again, this was The Seduction Mystique by Jeannie Sales. And I highly recommend this book and all of her other books. I love her books. I love her writing style. So I hope you enjoyed this reading and review. Thank you for listening.